Coming up on Digital Music Trends 188, recorded on the 18th of June 2014, YouTube causes a stir with imminent independent music takedowns, Amazon enters the on-demand space with Prime Music, Spotify makes it easier for developers to build awesome web apps, BitTorrent bundles reach 100 million downloads and streams, Samsung integrates Spotify Connect with its new wireless speaker range, Deezer's latest round of funding, and a chat with merch company Sidestep. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Lionelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as an audio show as well as a, a video show so you can find it pretty much everywhere on YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, iTunes of course, most podcatchers and uh, uh, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, really you name it, uh, you'll find it there. And uh, if you want to receive a weekly mail out uh, around the show and what we've done uh, in any particular week you can sign up on bit.ly slash DMT list and of course don't forget that you can send feedback via Twitter on at Trends or via email on contact at digitalmusictrends.com and this week it's an absolute pleasure to welcome uh, two great guests and uh, for the first time it's a great to welcome uh, Dan uh, Koplowitz, the founder of Friendly Fire Recordings based in San Francisco so hi Dan and thanks for uh, joining me it's a pleasure to have you Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you, and uh, we met at the Great Escape, so it's uh, it's great to connect again and uh, have a chat with you on the show. And I'm also really happy to welcome back a long, a long-standing guest of the show, <laughs> uh, Duncan uh, Gear. Actually, I have to ask you: Is it Gear or Gear? Because every time I yeah. ask myself, Gear, okay, I yeah, ask I like myself, Richard Gear, but with an extra e. <laughs> I ask myself, and every time I I, I feel like I'm I'm, I'm doing a, a, an injustice, uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> who writes some amazing pieces on Wired and a bunch of other publications, uh, and. Uh, uh, he writes about digital music but also about uh, uh, the environment and uh, weather related topics space related topics uh, and so a wide variety uh, there and it's anything great anyone you. will pay me to write about basically but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's so good to have you it's so good to have you and, you and you've just finished your masters as well which is awesome yep that's right yeah i'm uh, i'm based in sweden and uh, yeah it's a beautiful summer here we got midsummer coming up to, uh, <laughs> not tomorrow but the next day it's going to be wonderful and everyone if, dances around a big pole it's great yeah exactly and if you are interested in weather related topics uh, uh, your blog is uh, uh, looking up no, yeah i've actually um stopped doing looking right. up about uh, two weeks ago i probably right. should have mentioned that uh, but yeah <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, all still there and it's all still great so you should definitely go and read it but right. uh, there won't be any more coming up for the time being right but you can find everything on duncangear.com uh, duncangear.com exactly perfect awesome and so uh you know this week i was so determined not to start the show by talking about youtube i was like this is not gonna happen i'm gonna talk about something else amazon anything and then uh, this happened uh, yesterday with uh, the financial times piece published uh, uh, by uh, robert cookson uh, which uh, uh, contains quotes from uh, robert uh, kinsel youtube's head of content and business operations uh, who states that the service will start blocking uh, music videos uh, uh, from uh, labels that haven't signed on to its new terms uh, in a matter of days so this of course uh, caused a massive uproar in industry everybody's uh, is up in arms uh, wondering what's going to happen and uh, nobody actually thought that youtube was going to go through with it and actually start pulling videos uh, from independent labels and nobody actually knows what pulling means at this point uh, you know i woke up this morning with the realization that it's going to be very difficult for youtube to actually start pulling stuff completely down it might maybe halt monetization of the videos but actually pulling it would really put it in the crosshairs of of, uh, regulators both in the US and in in, the, in Europe especially where uh, regulators are pretty uh, go down pretty hard on this kind of behaviors by by monopolistic uh, uh, enterprises essentially and uh, uh, you know so so many points of view to, to you know to look at for example I was listening to the daily tech news show uh, uh, by Tom Merritt uh, yesterday he made a really good point saying that the company may invalidate its safe harbor status in the US by blocking content on its platform uh, for no valid reason essentially and uh, finally a uh, vivo's status is also a question mark we don't know what's going to happen to that content the company uh, vivo states that they are still going to have those videos on youtube if they're if they're going through them but uh, really it's a question mark uh, there so uh, you know really what are your thoughts you know dan you're in san francisco uh, what what is what's the sort of latest around there in the music community uh, as an independent label uh, do you feel like youtube is going to go through with this uh, or, or is it just insane what, what's happening they, they they certainly are acting like they're going to go through with it i'm not, I'm not sure why they would even threaten to do this unless they were planning on taking action because this right. isn't a, th this isn't exactly a, a popular statement as as you say uh I mean, I, i've heard this referred to in a, in a couple different places as a declaration of war uh, yeah now that might that might be a, a a bit of hyperbole 
but I, I, I can see the logic there. This is something that's going to hit, you know, they say it's about 10% of indie labels, but includes some big ones. It includes Excel, includes Domino. So this, you know, this means that we're going to be, if they go through with it, and if, if, they're, if the regulators allow them to go through with it, it means we're, you know, Radiohead videos might be disappearing. It means that, uh, you know, there's issues. Uh, it, it's, it's a thornier, like you say, which videos even get taken down, I think, exactly. are, yeah. it's, it's, it's open to debate. Uh, take something like Adele, which is uh, on XL in the UK and Columbia in the States. So is, are her videos taken down in the UK only? Or are they kept up in the States? I mean, it's, it's a bit of a logistical uh, minefield, and it's, it's a very aggressive action on YouTube's part. Yeah. I have to assume that they... Uh, you know, spoke amongst themselves and crunched the numbers and decided that it was important enough to them to to get labels on board for this new paid service that they're going to be launching. Yeah. So important that they're essentially prepared to, to you know, use the nuclear option on labels who uh, aren't willing to go along. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Duncan, you know, what are your thoughts, uh, considering that you've uh, also covered the, this space for a number of years? And, uh, uh, you know, this seems uh, like a really strange fight to pick because independents are going to stir emotions. You know, if they pick the same fights with the major, majors, I don't think people would have had the same reaction. But because independents are involved, I think there's going to be a huge uproar here. I mean, like you said in the in the introduction to this story, this is something that we don't actually know a whole lot about yeah. yet, um, especially the mechanics of the whole situation, how this is going to work. At the moment, it seems to be just a lot of bluster and loud noises. But what I think is um, interesting in a kind of uh, placing it within this kind of historical context is that you don't often see Google playing hardball quite so publicly. Uh, they often like to cultivate a very, very kind of fluffy, nice, warm, everybody be friends image. Yeah. And uh, they're not really doing this. And, and partly you could say that's because it's the indies that dragged this out into the open uh, about a month ago with that angry letter and then more recently. But um, it's it's very rare to see, to see Google not then try and make some public steps to calm things down. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's an odd situation and I'm kind of surprised. Yeah, I'm surprised too because I thought... Uh, at one point, I thought surely, like the the quote was was misstated, and there's going to be a correction coming from YouTube soon around what actually was said in the Financial Times piece and what they actually meant. But now, you know, over 24 hours later, we haven't had any retraction or correction from YouTube, and so that's kind of weird. Uh, yeah, they seem to be quite happy to just uh, yeah. see what happens for the time being, which I mean, may be the best policy. I mean, they may be waiting to gauge what the public reaction is to this. I mean, you say it's going to kind of stir emotions. I think maybe not as many as it would have done, say, five years ago. Right. Um, because there are, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these indie artists are, are quite big. But um, yeah, I think I think that they sort of sit alongside the majors very, very much now in a way that perhaps they didn't used to. Yeah, I mean, I also take I take exception to the to the percentage that was presented as well because uh, I was at a Merlin uh, keynote of Charles Caldas at the uh, AIM uh, uh, Music Connected Day just a couple of months ago, and he was talking about the fact that uh, you know uh, independent labels uh, have a thirty plus percent. Uh, it was thirty two, I think, market share when it comes to digital uh, in the U in uh, yeah. In, I think it was in the US, but I just have to double check on Is that. Is that in terms of downloads or streams or uh, YouTube I think it was overall, or? overall digital market share uh, for, okay. the, for the independents. And here, you know, we're seeing the statement saying that they have 90% of labels on board and 10% are not. But then if all of the labels that are represented by AIM and all the other independent bodies worldwide are on the same boat and are making a united, uh, united front on this, then I can't understand how they can claim that they have 90% of the content or of the labels on board. It, it doesn't add up. No, definitely. I think, I think, the, I think one of the... To, go on, Sorry, I, I was going to say, I, th I think one of the dangers here is that this isn't just inside baseball. This is something that will affect uh, fans and consumers as well. Right. And, you know, the rest of the world, aside from this you know, slightly uh, rarefied uh, music industry, doesn't necessarily care too much about royalties and percentages. But when you're a... 14 year old and you want to go and watch your new favorite video and you go onto YouTube and it's blocked you, you, I think we're going to, I think we're in danger of seeing an uproar from from fans and consumers as well I'll right. say that I if, think, I, if, I, think I, if, if I were if I were Vimeo right now I'd be uh, I'd be meeting in my war room to to make plans and and see how we could capitalize on this yeah sure absolutely but I mean I think in the situation you just described where 14 year old goes and finds that his favorite video isn't on YouTube the first place he heads is the Pirate Bay it's not he doesn't get angry he just uh, yeah 
goes and downloads it somewhere else, which doesn't give any money to the fans at all, to the bands at all. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the other thing that you you should could do again in the realm of speculations would be to remove access to uh, the the monetization option features mm. and leave the videos up there, which would hurt the bands equally as much and probably force them to pull the video, but maybe wouldn't come, you know, wouldn't uh, run into the same regulatory hurdles that it might run into if it actually removes actively removes the video because they don't want to accept their terms uh, I th yeah i mean i think if they remove sort of tools like content id from the labels as well alongside this stuff then that would really erode their argument big time because then that casts them very much as um a company that doesn't respect copyright at all if you take yeah. away tools for for the labels to protect themselves in that way yeah uh, we'll see what happens i mean again we're speculating here uh, we've seen some uh, mm. strong statements from uh, the uh, indie music week conference uh, by uh, rich bangloff uh, the president of a2im who sort of uh, uh, backs up uh, the the indie position uh, that youtube is not playing by the rules here or playing fairly uh, and we'll see what happens next week i'm sure uh, we might have to open up with uh, this story once again because it's uh, probably <laughs> Uh, the <laughs> one of the biggest stories of the year uh, after Apple buying Beats, actually probably bigger than Apple buying Beats uh, in uh, actual terms. Uh, and the uh, um, uh, second story of the day, uh, to, we have to talk about Amazon. Of course, uh, uh, Amazon has launched its uh, new streaming music streaming service uh, after a few months of rumors and people were kind of going back and forth as to whether this was going to happen or not. But it actually did happen. And uh, uh, the Amazon decided to launch with a limited catalog. They couldn't get everybody on board. Uh, they're only featuring slightly older content six months old or uh, older uh, and they don't have universal music on board which is a pretty bold choice considering that most uh, uh, streaming services out there consider universal music to be uh, sort of the first port of call when they're trying to get blanket licenses sure. on content and uh, uh, you know it's going to be available to prime subscribers in the US uh, uh, who pay $99 per year uh, and they also get you know the two day free delivery in the US uh, access to the uh, video instant video service and uh, the Kindle book loan program and uh, uh, so music is just a small part of this so 1 million tracks as opposed to you know the 15 20 millions on other services and uh, a limited catalog so uh, what do you guys think uh, do you think that this can catch on even with its uh, limited scope uh, or are users just going to be turned off by the fact that they can't find the latest hits on the service uh, dan i think that by their own admission uh this this service isn't really designed to appeal to hardcore music fans. I, I think the idea here, as you say, it's not really just about music. It's about adding value to a program that already exists with the free delivery, and the videos, and and, and so on. You know, Amazon has this catalog. It, it's you you can't really argue that the catalog is as good as the other streaming services because objectively it isn't. Yeah. But the point is, for people who haven't gotten on board with Spotify, who aren't necessarily going to go and pay to download music on iTunes, but they like to listen to something in the background. They like to go and listen to their their favorite record from five years ago. It's it's just to, to me it's 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 added value to it, it's not really the centerpiece. It's uh, it's yeah. it's icing on the cake as I see it. And and as such, I, I think it's a smart idea. I, this is not going to be the uh, this won't be the iTunes killer. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily trying to be. I think it's Amazon just trying to use everything that they have in their arsenal to, to build as, as strong of an offering as possible. Yeah. Uh, that being said, Universal not being part of the catalog is... Uh, that's, that's, that's a major yeah, omission. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's, that's not a small thing. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think they figured that something is better than nothing. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and uh, uh, it's interesting, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely good to see uh, one large company that decides to go without Universal's catalog and, and then we can see what the public's reaction is because they have such a huge, uh, you know, percentage of the marketplace these days. And so uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, so uh, uh, Duncan, uh, uh, some headlines actually said uh, Amazon opens the biggest uh, uh, on-demand streaming music service in the US because they already have 11 million Prime subscribers. Uh, is that sort of a misrepresentation of what this actually is, given that <laughs> users haven't asked for it or are not specifically yeah, paying for course. it? Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, you've got to ask yourself what percentage of those users are actually going to start using this. And, yeah. and I imagine it's going to be probably below 50%, uh, probably significantly below 50%. Um, I think, to be honest, I, I don't have an awful lot to add to what Dan said. 
said. But yeah. I will say that I think in about a month, we'll all have forgotten that Amazon has a streaming music service. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a bold prediction, and uh, it's, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I mean, until I, they get Universal on board, anyway, and then we'll report on it again, and then forget again. Probably. I mean, talking about Amazon, actually, they are uh, about in 15 minutes time. Uh, they are supposedly going to announce a, a new phone. Uh, yeah, yeah, 3D, 3D phone. device. Yeah, 3D. 3D. So that's definitely not music related. Uh, but if they, if, they, if they do bundle music into the phone experience, then maybe there's something there for the streaming service uh, on top of everything else. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's possible. And and yeah, and that could drive more users. And but but yeah, I mean yeah, Dan is absolutely right. This is just a gambit to try and get a few more prime users or to persuade people that are sitting on the fence thinking, is this worth it? Oh yeah, yeah we get some music. Yeah, go on then, let's pay. Especially Let's as they raise the price by 20 bucks uh, uh, as of uh, this month or last month. You be 79 dollars mm. and that's 99 so still not yeah so they're, they're in this war trying to convince people that it's worth money and yeah, yeah. some people are going to be persuaded surely <laughs> the music is almost a loss leader for them i think exactly. I, I don't think they're, they're not necessarily looking to, to change the game they're they're looking to entice some new customers who like duncan said who are on the fence yeah yeah there's no and such, i think it's yeah, a smart basically. move i mean wh why not why not do it if you have that catalog it's yeah. uh yeah and I mean, and, and in that situation, you just you don't need Universal or anything. It's just right. it's just a bit of extra music. Yeah. But it feels like it's kind of weird because uh, we we've been talking for years now on DNT about the fact that music doesn't really uh, move the needle that much. But then again, this year we're really seeing uh, you know a call to arms by all the major companies to try and position themselves in the music space uh, as. Uh, somebody that has a presence and that can sort of hold their own uh, with consumers. So, you know, but why, as a more general, uh, you know, point, uh, why do you think that is? Do you think that's because uh, the music is going to drive uh, engagement and retention and, and therefore is more valuable than we've been thinking uh, over the last couple of years when we, you know, sort of thinking, oh, okay, there's a music <sighs> edition, but it's not, it's not going to make the difference? Uh, or is it just the fact that they are trying anything to find a differentiating point than uh, competitors at this point? I think they've probably been trying to sign the deals for two years and they've only just now yeah, managed it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case, actually. Yeah, cause, uh, the first rumors came probably late last year about this. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting... Uh, thing going on uh, we're seeing so many different companies move into the space we're seeing google uh, apparently also interested in purchasing uh, internet radio services with eight tracks uh, uh, an, an offer on eight tracks and now potentially an offer on songs are so really a lot of uh, hard uh, positioning from big companies to try and get uh, uh, a big stake in the music space and uh, uh, we don't really know why yet uh, so <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good news at the end of the day because yeah. more competition in the market is good and more innovation in the market is good and i mean, I mean, Spotify has been, a, I think, a really great positive force. I think possibly Dan might disagree with me there. I don't know what your position is on that. But, um, uh, yeah, some people would disagree with that. But I think it has been a really, really positive force for getting more people to listen to more music all over the world. Yeah. Dan, do you agree and, with that? And, and the more of that there is in the world, the more services there are doing that, the better. As a fan, I love Spotify. As, as a music consumer, which in many ways is what I am first and foremost, I think Spotify and RDO and the streaming services are, are, are the greatest things in sliced bread. I mean, it's, uh, it's hard not to enjoy them. As, a sense of butt. As, well, there, there, there's a butt. I mean, as, as a label, of course, I would like to see. <laughs> I, I would let you know. I, I, I see the, the royalty reports when they come in, and I see that they can be... S slender would be a, a, a generous way to put it uh, for a small indie label. Um, and I think, you know, we're still, I think everyone on both sides is trying to find, negotiate a solution to that. But it, yeah. it may just be trying to square the circle. It may, it may just not be doable. Um, Can I ask a I question, think it's Dan? Sure. Did you ever um, sort of monitor at any point the piracy levels of, of your, your musician's work? Uh, I, I, I monitored it, uh, s sort of subjectively. I mean, I could see, mm -hmm. I would, you know, I would go and search. I never hired, uh, you know, there are certain companies that will actually, yeah. you can yeah. hire them and they will issue takedown notices and scour the web. And I did to be frank, I didn't really have the resources to do that. But certainly when I put out a popular record, you know, a, a, a little bit of Googling, you, you know, within about five minutes, you can see how readily available your stuff is. And, you know, to translate that into, well, how many sales am I losing? It, it's, it's, it's risky business there. The math gets fuzzy because it's not that every single person who's illegally downloading your record is someone who otherwise, in the absence of that download link, would be going and buying it. Yeah, Some people sure. are just, 
they're they're mildly interested and they say okay I'll give this a listen there's nothing to lose yeah so I monitored it and I mean, there's no there's no doubt that I mean I, I think it, by, by this point in 2014 it's it's uh, pretty inarguable that piracy <laughs> damages sales I don't think I I, I, I think the the, the the verdict is in on that one uh, but in, in terms of putting an exact number on it I'd, I'd be reluctant to do so yeah okay no I'm just curious because I mean my my impression is that Spotify has more than anything else has killed piracy in any significant way I, I don't know anybody among my circle of friends who still pirates music in any way whatsoever since the arrival I agree of Spotify with you. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. I mean, considering that piracy, you know, mo uh, not I shouldn't say most because there's plenty of sort of casual fans doing it. But you know, so any any hardcore music fan who's going to go and steal, you know, steal these things or download them illegally, if they can find them easily and legally and cheaply or free on Spotify or one of the st other streaming services, I think they will. Yeah. Um, and, and and you know, in that sense, as a label, my attitude is better better to get some royalty than no royalty at all. Yeah, and hopefully and, like uh, in, in the next uh, few months, I mean, Spotify started on that, but uh, you're going to start getting some more data as well on who is consuming it and where and why. Mm. Which is, That'll be interesting to see. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you're talking about piracy and, uh, of course, uh, the guys at BitTorrent would hate me to tag the story uh, after <laughs> afterwards, but uh, <laughs> it kind of seems like a natural segue at this point. And uh, uh, BitTorrent announced uh, the latest numbers around its uh, bundles initiative, uh, and uh, they've reached 100 million downloads and streams uh, since the initiative's launch, uh, launch uh, which uh, happened in March, no, sorry, May 2013, that was. Uh, so it's been uh, a little over a year. Uh, pretty successful, you know, they've uh, grown by 1,095% uh, in uh, users, uh, monthly users since May um, of last year, uh, with it uh, reaching 25 million users per month, uh, uh, and uh, return rates are very impressive, 75%, and 25% of visitors share the content within their networks. So uh, overall, it seems like a pretty rosy picture. And also, they you know they had artists involved from uh, Moby to Diplo to Lee Scratch Perry, Madonna, Public Enemy, and Amanda Palmer. Lots of different artists and filmmakers involved in the initiative. Uh, uh, but I kind of wanted to go back to uh, the idea of uh, revenues because. Uh, uh, one of the things that s struck me around the blog post that the company published is the fact that they um, talk about the fact that, for example, Netflix doesn't have a catalog big enough to be sustainable for, for smaller independent fi filmmakers because they don't have enough enough movies on there. Uh, and uh, YouTube doesn't pay enough. You know, if they pay, they said, you know, uh, YouTube pays around 1,750 bucks per million streams, which of course varies by uh, by artist and by, by depending on who you're using for monetization. Uh, and, and, you know, the planning this uh, painting this picture of these services not being sustainable but at the same time i haven't yet seen the bundles being used effectively for monetizing something uh, you know the usually the two tier uh, bundle uh, is uh, the second tier is unlocked via an email address or by doing a social action uh, i haven't uh, come across many bundles that have uh, a payment option which is is possible but it's not hasn't been implemented really so m my question is like where can bitorn take this uh, next uh, People are using these, uh, they are downloading them. Uh, can artists actually start making money out of them? Uh, Duncan, what, what do you reckon? Well, I mean, this is a promotional tool at the end of the day. This is about right. getting more people to listen to music. Um, it's not about making money in the same way that putting a track on SoundCloud isn't about making money. It's about getting it out there and getting it heard by lots of people. Yeah. And from the stats that you've been citing and that BitTorrent has reported, it seems like that has been a tremendously successful thing to do. Um, I, it would be interesting to see someone try and charge for it. I don't think it will necessarily be that successful, but then that's not what BitTorrent is really built for. BitTorrent is a tool to share something as far and wide as quickly and efficiently as possible and make it continually available um, always. Yeah. You know, your website can't crash because you're getting it not off a website, you're getting it off a million people around the world. So it's, it's an incredibly effective tool at doing what it does, but that tool needs to be used in the right way. You yeah. know, I, I think in a way asking if artists can make money on this is kind of a bit like saying, can you, you know, use a screwdriver to bash a nail into the wall? It's, it's not really what it's designed to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally get it and I I'm totally agree with you. The, the one thing that I was I was questioning was why did they open the, the blog post by talking about the money that artists are making from YouTube and the 
you know, Netflix and stuff. I, I, I just seemed like yeah, that was a little odd. I, I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> you no, know, it was it was a, it was a well written blog post, and so and and clearly written by you know an an intelligent team of people. So you have to assume that if they're not talking about the amount of money that's been brought in, that's not an accidental oversight. That's right. an intentional omission. Yeah, I have to I have to tip my head uh, tip my hat to to BitTorrent. I mean, a hundred million downloads is is a lot. And that's impressive, and the yeah. fact that they got I think, somewhere in the area of of nine million for Moby uh, alone. I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's impressive. And, and, you know, frankly, you know, any of these uh, services that gains traction uh, deserves to be applauded because it gives them a little more leeway to, to play around and experiment in the future. But like Duncan says, I think this is for the, for the artists involved. And it's not just artists because I do, there's films and, you know, there's other, other things, yeah. but for the purposes of our conversation, we can talk about music. I think it's, it, it works as, as a promotional tool. Yeah. And actually in an interesting way, I think it, it works as a promotional tool for, for BitTorrent, which is a company that is, yeah. I think, trying to rehabilitate their image a yeah. little bit. I mean, you, you know, you, you said that they would dislike it if you, you know, opened this conversation, but, you know, by uh, tagging it with piracy. And I, I think you're absolutely right. I think they would dislike it. Uh, and I think this, this is their attempt to, to go legitimate. Yeah. Um, and as such, I think they're, they're doing a really good job with it. Um, where you go from here how you monetize it for the artists and, and how BitTorrent monetizes it for themselves, uh, I, I think is an open question. I'm not sure if we've seen the answer to it yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been, a, you know, it's only been in 13 months, so it's definitely still in the experimental stage, but uh, I would love to see an experiment on a large scale with one of the big artists to see if people are actually going to pay for this and uh, how much. And uh, uh, moving on, uh, I'm getting more and more confused by Samsung's strategy uh, when it comes to digital music. Uh, so the company, uh, of course, it it's, has a <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge strategy. It's a huge company, so it can't, you know, th th that has to be said. They have so many different divisions, but after announcing a partnership with Spotify, uh, sorry, with uh, Deezer in Europe uh, with the release of their latest handsets. Uh, so you get six months free uh, of, uh, of Deezer uh, Premium. Um, after doing that and after launching Milk uh, South by Southwest, which is their internet radio service, which also now has includes some premium tiers, uh, and that's the US only, uh, the company uh, also announced the last week the integration with Spotify, but only for its uh, uh, new line of wireless speakers uh, called Series M. And so essentially they integrated the Spotify Connect technology that was announced earlier in 2013 um, and hasn't actually been used by a whole lot of manufacturers yet. It hasn't really taken off uh, in in any significant way because I keep looking for speakers that are, have this integrated and come up pretty short they only have uh, a very few models that have them um, and so uh, yeah uh, Samsung announced this and uh, uh, they will be the first speakers to actually allow Spotify Connect uh, to work uh, uh, across uh, multiple speakers uh, simultaneously uh, Spotify Connect uh, actually I should point out allows uh, users to pass the signal of the of the track they're playing on from their phone onto the speaker but it actually pulls the speaker actually starts pulling the track from the cloud instead of pulling it from the device so you're not tied to, to spatial issues or Bluetooth issues or any, any other kind of stuff and it should be it's pretty seamless uh, from, from the looks of it so uh, I don't know uh, Dan do, do, how, how do you feel this can comp compete with uh, the likes of Sonos I mean obviously that's uh, that's the target here and uh, uh, do you reckon that uh, uh, you know it makes sense for Spotify Connect to continue growing or is 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 the fact that it's so tied out to, to hardware going to be a pretty hard sell for other manufacturers? Well, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't have a strong opinion on, on, on this topic. Right. I, I think it's, I, in, in some ways, I think it's a bit of a non-news item mm. in the sense that, as I understand it, I mean, you know, most, th there's already so many wireless speakers out there. The fact, you know, Sonos and, and, and Jambox and so on, that, you know, it's, it feels, this feels like a, a, a little bit Absolutely. too late. To, to, to be to be groundbreaking news, I think it's cool. I think it, I think it's a way for uh, for Spotify to to sort of show off this technology that that they've developed. Um, and as such, I think it's cool. But I, I'm not sure why this news would make. It, I don't think it would make me run out and and <laughs> buy these speakers. I already have a pair of wireless speakers yeah. that I can play anything on on my phone or on my laptop. Yeah. Uh, that being said, I haven't used the speakers, and you know, if, if, if the functionality is, is really strong, and it works in such a way that there's no danger of the signal cutting out, you know, I mean, if, I, I know that the Bluetooth can be a little, it, 
it can be a little wonky if I'm, you know, if I'm streaming from my phone to a wireless speaker on the other end of the room and I walk too far away with my phone, it's, it's game over. It cuts off, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so, so the thought of having a, you know, a, a wireless speaker that can stream Spotify and is pulling it from the cloud and therefore you don't have to be t- too concerned about your own positioning with regard yeah. to the speaker, it, 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 it's a nice thing. I don't necessarily see it as a game changer. Um, I'm actually waiting for my gramophone to be delivered next month at some point. They, sh- they should start shipping them. So we'll see how that works uh, against uh, other types of uh, wireless streaming consumption. Uh, uh, well, Duncan, do you, do you use Sonos? What, what do you use? Uh, I used to use Sonos a lot. Um, now I tend to just listen to headphones plugged into my laptop more yeah. than anything else on my phone. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's old school, I know, but it works and it sounds nice. Um, yeah, I mean... What what I think is missing in in a lot of this hardware discussion around streaming music to these things is a kind of central standard that can just be used by everybody. I mean, you've got Spotify Connect, as you say. Apple has AirTunes or whatever it's called. uh, AirPlay, sorry. Um, Google has got sort of Chromecast, even though that's more sort of focused around video. It also obviously does audio. There's there's no kind of one central thing that everybody can hook into. All of these music streaming services and all of these bits of hardware and just make them talk to each other nicely. And having that in place would be really nice. It would make it so much easier easier for everybody and better for consumers. Yeah, and it's going to be so tough to see a standard come up from that because uh, yeah. these companies just relish siluses. So yeah, absolutely. And and for consumers, it just becomes confusing, and so nobody yeah. wants to jump in because then you get format wars, and uh, it's yeah, it's it's fine. It's I'm not I'm not terribly excited about the news. No, as it no, is, no I'm not terribly excited. I just wanted to point it out because uh, it was just funny to to think, for example, you know, uh, a European consumer buying a Samsung phone with a Deezer subscription and then getting the speaker that currently only works with Spotify. And doesn't actually work with yeah. I mean, Samsung so is so big that the, the yeah. fingers don't know what the thumb is doing, let alone the shoulder <laughs> or the ankle or something. Yeah. There's not a lot of uh, internal consistency to, to, no. to, the log- uh, to the business decisions. Exactly, it makes sense. And uh, uh, I just wanted to introduce a quick interview that I made uh, last, uh, recorded last night with the company Sidestep. I read an interesting feature on them on Pando Daily, and uh, you know they are a startup focusing on improving the experience of acquiring merchandise at gigs. Uh, so I thought I'd get in touch with the founder and uh, let you know what that's all about. So here it is. And it's a real pleasure today to welcome to the show Eric Jones, the CEO of the company Sidestep. Uh, so hi, this Eric, and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Of course. Great. How are you doing? Great. It's great to have you. And so uh, I want to hear a little bit more about the company. Of course, uh, uh, I read the Pando Daily article about uh, your uh, launch uh, um, and the, the increase of the of this uh, Fall Out Boy uh, uh, merchandise uh, uh, contract. But first of all, mm-hmm. what is Sidestep all about? So Sidestep is a way that you can browse and buy concert merchandise over your phone for either pickup or delivery. So if you're going to a show two weeks from now, you can open up the app and see what the artist is selling, buy your items, choose the show, and pick it up at the show in a shorter line. That's great. And so when did the company set out? Uh, we released our beta in September 2013, um, so about 11 months ago, and our new iOS app just came out last week. How many bands have you worked with so far, and, and what's, your, what's your aim in terms of uh, level? Are you working mainly with uh, smaller or medium artists, uh, or yeah. are you open just to bigger artists? Um, right now we work with about 15 artists. Um, right. We're trying to take it slow just to, you know, just make sure that everything's working really well and the app is of high quality and the on-site experience is really good for users that use the app. Um, of course. But we have some partnerships that are forming um, with other merchandise companies right now and other uh, pretty cool partners. So slowly yeah. starting in the fall, we're going to expand a lot more. That's great. And yeah, you work with a couple of great artists. So you work with the Downtown Fiction. And, and those are sort of in the, in the middle tier, I guess, of uh, uh, popular act, but not mega stars. And you also work with Fall Out Boy. So how do those two experiences differ in terms of fulfillment and, <laughs> and volumes? Yeah. Um, so we're trying to focus more on the... Um, Mostly higher tier artists. Right. Um, I think Sidestep would be used best in those situations at those bigger venues. Um, but we'd like to try with mid tier artists as well, just to see, um, you know, different, different tests to see if, you know, for example, if Fall Out Boy um, is on the app and then the user buys from the new links, for example, another smaller yeah. artist. We like to see cross sales where, you know, it shows that people are viewing other stores and if they like Fall Out Boy, maybe they'll like from the new links. And as the app continues to grow, we're going to try to get smarter and smarter and actually curate artists for, for users. Yeah, absolutely. And so talking about Fall Out Boy, uh, how did you start working with them? How, how did that come about? Yeah, so the um, lead investor in Sidestep actually owns a merchandise company um, called Manhead Merchandise, and they work directly with Crush Management, and Crush is the manager to Fall Out Boy, yeah. um, you know, Pancake the Disco Train. So 
it's been a huge um huge connection huge help to getting us started from there actually you are moving on to uh working on their entire uh, tour for uh, us tour for the next few months so uh, how are you planning on that and, and uh, how, you know <laughs> is, is that going to be a massive uh, nightmare or is it just you know a, a scaling of the same platform and it should be relatively manageable yeah i mean we we're doing three tours this summer the first one's fall of away yeah. and we're doing Pank the disco then manic the and gavin de Graal. and we're just trying wow. to use each tour as its own separate test to make sure yeah. The on-site experience is awesome. The app is running really well. Um, so logistically, I think it's going to run very smoothly. Um, you know, we're bringing a new technology into venues that haven't had something like this. Yeah, really in a long time. I think the most innovation has been Square, um, and credit card unit for um, local sellers. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how people react to sidestep um, yeah. from the crew to the, the venues. Um, the fans so we'll see what happens yeah absolutely and so uh, talking about that like actually um one of the th things that's interesting is, is that uh, of course people can browse the product products beforehand but also perhaps you can also pair it up with uh, uh, the support act that generally doesn't sell uh, anywhere near as much as the main band but this way maybe people are going to be able to get to know the support act before they actually go to the venue which would be quite nice yeah exactly i think that's the most exciting part is we're seeing um which i mentioned before bigger artists um in the same card, products uh, from Fall Boy, you know, for many lengths is in the same card. And, you know, so it's just, it just shows that people are very curious about other artists and with Sidestep they're discovering, you know, not only really good products from those artists, but also maybe the arts for the first time, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah, of course, and you guys don't don't come into the fulfillment of, of it. It's purely a service. So essentially, you don't compete with any of the merch providers. It's more a case of uh, acting as, as an intermediary in order to, to allow the fulfillment of the sales and the, and the pre-order of, of the items. Exactly, and I think more so than that, we are also supplying the merch companies with new data they haven't had before, yeah. where if we go live with Fall Boys merchandise two weeks before the tour starts, we can see you know, the top markets, the top items, which size is gonna sell in a certain market, and all this data can be used to make better tour projections and just to have your, your tour business in, in line better. So it's definitely really exciting for the merch companies. That's fantastic. And Eric, thanks so much for your time, and we'll keep an eye on side steps. Awesome. Thanks, man. Appreciate Cheers. it. Thank and you. And we're back. And so, uh, Duncan, do you reckon that uh, this is something that you would use if you were going to gig and you could order merchandise in advance uh, and uh, not have to queue or not have to, you know, uh, find out that your size uh, extra, extra large or extra, extra small is sold out? It's a pretty neat concept. I like the, the idea, the concept. It's not something I've heard of before. It's pretty original. But I, I guess the, the difficulty would be, would be making sure the fans know that it's available. Because yeah. I think a lot of people just show up at gigs without you know, thinking too much about it other than we're going to see a band. They're not going to look for an app or anything in advance. There would have to be pretty clear communication that you can do this. And even then, a lot of people might not actually want to buy a t-shirt until they've seen the band or, yeah. or something like that. Or seen the uh, iTunes see, in see question. The t yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, um, but then on the other hand, you know, online shopping for clothes has been tremendously successful. So <laughs> maybe maybe it will uh, maybe it will work out just fine. I hope it does. I think it's a neat idea. Yeah, it's a good idea. They seem to have done pretty well with a uh, follow boy, and they've extended the contract with them. So uh, it's uh, an exciting, interesting startup. And uh, uh, Dan, uh, on, on your front, how are your bands handling merchandise these days? It's a topic that I'm quite interested in because uh, from South by onwards, I've seen that there's more and more companies trying to break the merch uh, sort of. Uh, disaster loop which is you know a fairly inefficient system right now in the US especially absolutely it is I mean I, I, first of all I think I think this app is a great idea um, I think you know I think the, the it will be of, of somewhat limited use I, I don't see this as, as you know ch changing the entire landscape but that but that's no slight on it I think it makes sense especially for larger artists who do sell out of their merch although of course you know it, it also begs the question why isn't why aren't bands uh, being a little more uh, logical about planning their merch out right if you're, if you're yeah. selling out of your size extra large show after show after show you maybe you should bring some more extra large t-shirts uh, I actually th I think the you know the 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 best thing that's happened to, to ban merch or, or, or to enabling bands to sell their merch at shows is is you know the um, uh, uh, wireless uh, you know credit card technology, Square and things like that. I mean that yeah. that's been a game changer, and and almost every band that I know brings that along on tour uh, because ha having been a, a merch guy in in my younger years, it can be maddening when you have a, a swarm of people you know rushing at you thrusting $20 bills in, in your face and, and making change and, and, and it, it, it can be problematic yeah 
uh, especially if you've had a couple drinks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as, as far as like uh, services that are being used, uh, you know, have you seen anything come up or being people switch into that? Given that Topspin now has been incorporated in another company, and maybe people might want to move on to the, the different services. What, what, you know, have you have you got any feelers uh, on, on that and what bands are choosing right now? I mean, I. I still think that the best way to sell merch is, I mean, it, it can be done more efficiently. I, I think you're right that there are sort of, there are, there are gross inefficiencies in, in how it's done. But I, I think the, the majority of merchandise purchases are impulse purchases. Right. Uh, it's, it's someone at the show. It's maybe the, it's an opening band. They, they've never seen them before. They're impressed and they want to walk home with the CD. I mean, frankly, that's probably where you see the most physical product being sold it's just yeah. people right there in the moment saying well this is great i want to you know the, the band said on stage that they're selling their cds and they need gas money to get to the next town sure i'm going to go i'm going to go buy that i'm going to go buy a t-shirt yeah. um i i like the idea for this app it, it does make me wonder if people are going to take the time uh ahead of time to log on to yeah. the app purchase and reserve a merchandise item why they couldn't just as easily just go assuming the band has a, a top spin store or some sort of you know online con, uh, consumer facing uh, shop. Why they couldn't just buy it right there and then and yeah. not have to deal with picking it up at the show at all. Yeah. Um, but you know, so the, the the only not not flaw necessarily, but the only drawback I see in this app is that I think it presumes that people are think about this before they get to the show, and right. I, I'm not sure that they do. I think it's a for a lot of people, I think it's a fairly impulsive behavior. Yeah. Um, th that being said, I think I mean I think it's a cool app. I I, I wish it all the best. I'd I'd love to see it succeed. And and, and anything that uh, that helps artists sell more merch uh, and helps fans get the things that they want. I mean it's a it, it's a good thing. There's it's not much bonus. to criticize there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it's it's a good thing. And uh, uh, so talking about, I wanted to move on to talk about uh, money. So uh, we've seen. Uh, uh, I mean, I want to cover this, this briefly because there's not really a huge amount to say here, but uh, uh, it's worth mentioning that French music streaming service Deezer has. Had a new injection of cash, a cash courtesy of uh, German media entity Pro Siebensat, uh, one which is a very user friendly name. Uh, so, <laughs> the amount of investment has not been officially disclosed. Uh, it's been reported as being in the region of $150 million. Uh, and uh, it adds to the money already raised by Deezer, and that uh, uh, takes a total to uh, about $300 million, which is a, a pretty neat amount, uh, just a couple hundred millions below what Spotify has raised so far, as far as. Uh, uh, um, as far as I remember and uh, uh, Deezer has been gearing up for launch in the United States uh, this year and uh, uh, nobody really understands how they will launch uh, in the sense that there doesn't seem to be a lot of space uh, uh, left uh, in that market uh, unless they manage to pull out of the hat an amazing partnership I mean I know that for example Verizon hasn't got a really steady partner on streaming uh, I know they have some stuff going with the uh, with Rhapsody but not nothing major and they're the second uh, uh, um, operator in the US and also we haven't seen uh, uh, Time Warner Cable or Comcast uh, uh, take sides on that so if Deezer could snag one of those as a partner that could be pretty interesting but you know uh, what do you guys make of the uh, the fundraise but especially uh, you know for, for you Dan and, and also Duncan what, from, from an outside perspective what do you think of their potential entry into the US is there any way to get into this market now without a huge partner Dan <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, 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 I mean, obviously, obviously, this is great news for Deezer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's. I mean, anytime you get an infusion of cash, uh, I mean, it, it it expands your options. I think that's fantastic, and I think you're absolutely right that th that their strategy. Not that not that I'm privy to it, but. The you know the to me the smart money is that that any strategy for launching in the states has to include having some really strong partners right out of the box. Um, you know I know that one of Deezer's selling points is that uh, you know a higher percentage of their users are paying. Um, that being said, I'm not sure how that would necessarily translate into success in the states because <laughs> if they're launching in this market, there's there's no real reason to assume unless they have really have an ace up their sleeves that consumer behavior is going to be radically different for Deezer than it's been for Spotify and Beats and, and RDO and so on. Um, I I do wonder. I mean, I, I I agree with what Duncan said earlier that you know more competition is is always better. Um, yeah. And I I would welcome. I'm I'm excited uh, for the day that Deezer launches in the states. Uh, but I do wonder if maybe they've just 
you know, if 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 if, if that ship has sailed, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that you know, the, the market is is consolidating so quickly, and it seems like there's there's less and less space to really make a make a name for yourself. And I think for consumers, just having one more option. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm very. I've thought about this a lot. I'm very curious to see what Deezer does. Yeah, next. they have to come. Uh, they have to come in with a splash of some sort. I don't yeah, know what, what it absolutely. can be, what it will be, but yeah. Duncan. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I, I don't have an awful lot to add to that. I, I, I think if I were Deezer, I wouldn't be chasing after America at all. I would, yeah. I would just regard that as as something to think about later if if they get the opportunity to, if they're lucky enough to get the opportunity to. Um, I think. If it were me, I would probably be shooting at like emerging markets. I'd be looking at you know South America, and I'd be looking at Africa and uh, parts of Southeast Asia. I think that would be a much smarter strategy for them to look at if they're looking for global expansion rather than just consolidating and fighting off Spotify in the territories that <laughs> they're in at the moment, uh, which I imagine they're having difficulty enough doing as it is. <laughs> My assumption is that even in France, they hardly have a, a stranglehold on the market. Uh, no, I don't so think I mean, so. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, you're right that, that f fighting a war on too many fronts, uh, well, I mean, you know, but, uh, having, having this, uh, this new investment, it gives, them, it gives them a bigger war chest yeah. and, and it allows them yeah. to pursue more of a, a multi-pronged uh, strategy. So it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other. Um, but I, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not like Spotify isn't, uh, you know, growing into emerging markets as well. Yeah. Uh, so it's, that's, it's, very that, that's not yeah. virgin territory either, of course. I mean, yeah. these are, is interesting because they, they are in the most territories of any other service. I think it's a, they listed as 180 plus territories. Also, they have taken particular care of doing little things like I was talking to the, uh, in, I, was, I did the Brazilian show last week and they told me that uh, these are the only service in Brazil that accepts local currency, which mm. means that uh, people that don't have international credit cards can actually pay for it. Uh, whilst with Spotify, it's only an international credit cards uh, deal, which restricts the entire service to only 5% of the population of Brazil that can actually pay for the service. Uh, so that's that's a problem. That's an interesting point, yeah. Uh, so that's a problem. So if they have taken care of doing stuff like that in other territories, then they definitely have a leg up. And, and you know, uh, as far as the story is concerned, actually, I should point out that uh, uh, ProZibinsat.1 has also another service called Ampia that is, is going to be rolled into uh, Deezer, so they're going to get those uh, uh, users as well. And uh, it has a deal with Vodafone in Germany that will be taken over there by Deezer, so uh, that's definitely some good news for the service uh, in Germany. Uh, and it's just a case of seeing where that money ends up, really, because uh, if they plan on spending the vast majority of it in the States, it just seems like a huge gamble for a market that is already... Uh, difficult and we've seen how much money Beats has spent uh, and even with their huge partnership with AT&T and with their brand name and everything else they've had a really hard time uh, getting started so uh, yeah we, sh we shall see what happens on that on that front and uh, uh, I want to uh, well the next big news the last big news I guess of the day is uh, Spotify so Spotify has announced the fulfillment of one of the promises that they made uh, at uh, the South by Southwest developer meetup that I attended in March uh, which was the launch of an exp expanded and improved uh, API which is a application programming interface for people in the audience that might not have heard about this term before it's essentially a way for apps to communicate with one another and exchange data so the new web api will allow applications to query the spotify catalog and users playlists through uh, http requests and will allow developers to pull data like album artwork 30 seconds previews of tracks top tracks per artist and per country album genres and a whole lot more and also it will allow web apis to uh, uh, sorry web applications to actually create playlists uh, on the go uh, directly on the application and sync them with the user's account uh, thanks to uh, uh, a new system of uh, um, uh, uh, authorizations and approvals uh, so you know this has been received really well and uh, it seems to be also a a direct result of the uh, Spotify's acquisition of the Econest because some of the changes uh, have been illustrated by uh, uh, Paul Lamier as, as being brought by the fact that uh, they extended uh, the Econest's integration with Spotify and uh, they created this uh, sort of Spotify uh, Rosetta Stone database which was the Econest's project to allow cross-platform integrations uh, uh, or cross-platform IDs uh, to be able to connect different services uh, across the board so this is all very complicated and I'm sure haven't done it justice it's just such a complicated story to tell but essentially you know it just seems like a 
a good way for Spotify to increase its uh, uh, presence as a platform, uh, increase uh, the you know the goodwill towards the developers and developers using Spotify as the base for their uh, apps and services, and uh, thus expanding essentially the Spotify ecosystem everywhere. Uh, since most of these services can only be accessed if you're a premium subscriber, you know it drives people to subscribing uh, to the service. Uh, uh, Duncan, uh, you know what do you make of this? You know, of course, uh, uh, you're more uh, hooked up to the developer community uh, in terms of feeds and stuff. It seemed like the reaction was really positive uh, all the way around. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be brilliant. It's not brilliant yet, but yeah. it is going to be brilliant because basically what, what Spotify is doing here is giving developers the tools to make really, really cool things for people who listen to music. Yeah, that's um, the easy They're making way it way it. Yeah. easier for people to build awesome web apps that pick it, awesome things out of Spotify's database and mix it up in really cool ways and then put it in the ears of consumers. And that is why it's great. I don't think your average mis music listener kind of needs to worry a lot of the time about sort of yeah. APIs and <laughs> yeah. things like that. But that, that is at the end of the day what it is. It's Spotify <laughs> being more open, being more accessible to programmers and really, really cool things are going to come out of it. No doubt. I have no doubt about that. Yeah. Uh, Dan, how, how, how is how's the temperature in San Francisco uh, around sort of the, the uh, community around Spotify is move into becoming a platform or rather you know like a, a reference point for a backbone for the for the uh, music industry uh, online do you think that's something that's welcomed by by the majority of people certainly yeah I mean what's what's not to like about it I, I think it's uh, I mean you know I, I couldn't code if you put a gun to my head so right. for, for me personally this is it's Gibberish. it's not good news or bad news so much as irrelevant <laughs> news but I do think I think for develop I mean this is you know this is clearly it's it's evidence that that Spotify's uh, acquisition of Echo Nest is starting to bear fruit yeah and I think I think it's a sign that you know I, I think it was that was generally hailed as a smart move when they did it uh, and I think it it can it continues to. I mean, it, it, it continues to seem to be a smart move, um, and I do think some neat stuff's going to come out of this. Certainly for for developers to be able to sort of piggyback on on Spotify, which is this very you know popular platform. And there's some cool stuff. I was reading about this uh, a road trip mixtape app yeah. that lets you <laughs> as 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 you're driving and you know you can listen to bands from the city that you're driving through. Yeah. That's something you know. The next time I uh, take a road trip, I think I'll try that out. I mean, it's it, it's it's there's some neat ideas and uh, certainly opening that api up uh, api up uh to, to developers is a positive thing and and the rosetta stone in, in as much as i understand it which is i i, I don't claim to have a, a complete understanding of it but but you know the, the the fact that it allows these track ids and lyric ids to sort of pull from from different services is is a good thing because yeah. anyone who anyone who's ever dealt with with metadata and ids knows that it's a it's a it, it it gets hairy really quickly. Yeah, I mean, I guess <laughs> um, the I guess the only negative about the, how Rosetta Stone is, is has evolved is the fact that uh, at the beginning it was going to be a, a database that was going to cross over uh, multiple streaming services as well uh, as all the other types of services related to music. Now it kind of feels like that's probably fallen down the way, wayside just because, uh, of course, now the company is owned by Spotify, so it wouldn't make well, sense for them to offer uh, a way for users to share tracks across different streaming services if you know they don't want to. So <laughs> exactly. that's that's Spotify getting their value. So that's the only of negative Echo part Nest. of this. I mean, when when they it 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 is you know arguably a, a negative for for consumers and it's a positive for Spotify. Exactly. Um, and I th I think that's why they purchased Echo Nest because if they have Echo Nest then no one else can have it. Yeah. Um, but that's not something that's not re replicable. I mean, I think it's something that is repli re replicable and there are companies that are working on doing this anyway. So uh, it's, it certainly doesn't restrict the market. I, 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 I don't know if I wholly agree with that. I mean, Echo really? has been working on this for a long time yeah. and they are very, very, very good at it. That level of expertise isn't matched anywhere else in the world, I would say, personally. Yeah. Um, yes, other people could do it, but it would take them a long time to get to the place where Echo Nest is today. And in the meantime, Echo Nest gets better and better better so yeah i i think it would be very difficult can i add one other thing about course, uh, the, yeah. the spotify thing i i think one thing that is is very important to mention here is that spotify is the only real streaming service that that does this yeah. in any significant way that has these kind of web apis <laughs> that lets music hackers kind of come in and and build awesome stuff with with people's music um and that is why they're winning that, that's because they know that the the freeing the the music as much as possible as much as the content creators will allow um i know that spotify is constantly arguing to to the content creators to just like open your hands a little bit and people will make really really cool 
cool things with this stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's 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 really really good, and it's and it's the reason why Spotify wins all the time because because their product is better. Yeah. And uh, no, I mean, uh, I have to point out that Deezer has made a lot of efforts recently to uh, get into that game uh, over mm. the last couple of years, uh, but it just doesn't seem to be getting the same traction as, as Spotify has uh, to this no. point. And of course, with uh, the the Econest uh, being now the backbone of the service, it's it becomes so much more developer friendly because the Econest yeah. know exactly what developers need, and they've been in that game for now for six years, seven years, and and they really know their stuff. So <laughs> even if yeah. the Spotify developers themselves may may have put out an API that maybe was not as user as, as a developer friendly the Econet guys are, are going to be able to fix that pretty quick so <laughs> it's definitely a plus for spotify there and uh, uh, finally i wanted to ask you duncan i wanted to ask you about this global radio uh, global breakfast radio article that you posted oh, yeah. that that sounds really fun it was awesome. It's uh, it's these guys, um, a pair of artists. Their names escape me now. I don't suppose you've got them in front of you, do you? Uh, no. Sebamina and another chap. Anyway, they built a, a an app that plays um, web radio from wherever it's breakfast in the world right now. And Daniel's so, Jones, sorry. <laughs> so you can always listen to breakfast radio from all over the world. So And they've got all these amazing, they've got a list of 190 odd uh, stations, all kinds of weird things like umpa music from Bavaria and then some <laughs> like, island in the in the middle of the Pacific where it's basically the only island in that time zone right. that has a radio station. And so they managed to kind of get their feed and, and everything. And they listened to all of these and they've curated this thing and i was listening to it for about uh, an hour the other day and it and it went through kind of like there was this california wine valley radio thing where it was all the latest wine valley news some company had taken over some other company and it was big news in this wine <laughs> valley and it's just it was a fascinating look at uh, um just these little kind of microcosms all over the world a really really nice illustration of the power of local radio actually absolutely, absolutely. amen to that that's a great idea that's yeah great. it's fantastic and so is, is that automated or, or per, uh, personally curated? Yeah, they've, they've automated it. Apparently, they're hand curating the list of stations and they're right. updating it from time to time as things go on and offline. Um, and they'll take suggestions. So if you have a particularly good breakfast show in your area, then you can send it to them and they'll include it if they like it. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 other than that, it's completely automatic. Awesome, man. Um, you know, that, that, that actually makes me think of something, uh, sort of tying it into our to our previous conversation. There, there was an app on Spotify, and I, I'm blanking on the name, but it, it came out about maybe six months ago or nine months ago, right. uh, that randomly selects a track on Spotify that has never been listened to ever by anybody. Right, yeah. Because there's so much un unlistened to catalog. And I, I love any of these services that, I mean, of, of course, there's an element of randomness to it, but... As 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 a just as a discovery tool uh, for music or for even just for talk shows or new perspectives, I think things like that are fantastic, and I, I I can see a lot of appeal to them. Yeah, I should check out actually where they are on that and whether they are actually managed to get anywhere near uh, <laughs> having all the tracks to listen to. I mean, that's that's an <laughs> unwinnable war, unfortunately, because uh, there's thousands and <laughs> thousands. Probably of more gets thing. added each day than exactly. can be listened to. Yeah. I suspect. Exactly. So, uh, but that that was a quite a fun project. You got a lot of press at the time, and uh, uh, that's pretty much it. Dan, anything too that you want to plug uh, pl plug your end uh, as far as the uh, label is concerned, or anything else? Well, I'm, I'm I might give you a a, a better Twitter. Uh uh, handle to follow me at right. because what what goes up is uh, virtually dormant. <laughs> right. Sorry. <laughs> um, that's okay. Uh, friendly at Friendly Fire Rec. Friendly Fire R E C is my uh, label and uh, sync licensing company. And uh, I'd encourage you all to check out a, a new Icelandic band I've been managing called Retro Stefson, who are really really good. Incredible band. I love that band. Awesome! Yay! I love hearing Yay, that. Yay! Everybody's happy. I've seen them a few yeah. times in Iceland, and they're wonderful. I, I would definitely also recommend that everybody listening checks out Retro Stefson. Really, really fun band. Yay! I'll, like I'll PayPal you uh, your, <laughs> your, your fee later on. <laughs> 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 and uh, and Duncan again, and we we uh, I'm going to direct people to DuncanGear.com, and also if you do a search for uh, Duncan Gear and Wired Wired, you're going to find all the articles that Duncan's posted there in the last few weeks, which uh, are great. There's a bunch of different things on music and on uh, you know environment, uh, weather, all sorts of stuff. So that's that's awesome. <laughs> and. Uh, Thank you. 
And yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks so much for uh, joining me on the show today. It was uh, really good fun recording it, and there was so much stuff to cover. Uh, and uh, uh, you can find everything on Digital uh, Music Trends on the site, of course, digitalmusictrends.com. And don't forget to check out the DMT one to one shows, uh, which cover interesting startups and interesting digital music projects. You can uh, find the show pretty much everywhere. So if you've listened to this show as a one off from uh, YouTube, for example, you can also go and subscribe as a podcast so it downloads automatically and you don't have to go and remember to go back to YouTube to listen to it and uh, you can of course uh, follow uh, the show on Twitter on at DG Music Trends uh, or subscribe to the, new let- to the newsletter on bit.ly slash DMT list uh, thanks so much for listening have a fantastic week and until uh, next time <laughs>